Good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Antonakis. Welcome to our event. It's amazing to me that another year has passed and we have another art prize upon us. It is actually almost over. And tonight we hold our ninth art prize panel discussion. We've been involved with art prize ever since the beginning and we've been able to exhibit amazing artworks in our Collins Art Gallery every year. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction. First of all, I wanted to mention that we have two venues on our campus. One is the Collins Art Gallery, and the other one is the GRCC Spectrum Theater. So I hope that you've had a chance to see both of those venues and many others across the city. Also, I wanted to mention that GRCC is very proud to be accredited by NASAD, the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. And that is an, uh, an accreditation for our art programs, and it's a stamp of the quality of the education that we offer here on our campus. So we're very proud of this, and I did not want to miss the opportunity to mention it to you. Okay, I have to get used to the technology here. The clicker is in my hand. Uh, so, I wanted to run through a couple of slides, just in case there is anyone who has not been to our gallery yet, uh, the GRCC Collins Gallery, and I will show you um, an image of each one of the major artworks that is being exhibited there at this moment. Uh, first of all, we'll start with this one. Uh, it's made by the group called Hipkiss. Uh, two artists, Chris and Alpha May Mason, they live in France. They call it Virtue, Virtu, Virtu. And it's an amazing drawing. I hope you've had a chance to see it with gold leaf and silver leaf. And uh, uh, they are the two-dimensional finalists in that category according to the announcement that the jurors made. So we're looking forward to seeing if there is a chance that they'll win. Uh, it's pretty amazing as an accomplishment for them and we're very proud to have the artwork in our gallery. Uh, these works of ceramic are by Madeline Kaczmarczyk. Uh, she is a Grand Rapids artist. She's very well known in the area and the pieces are called Connections Collectively. Next, we have a work of art by Zevi Colgini. He is from Tirana in Albania, and he is not in the States at this moment, so he couldn't join us. He calls this piece Intertwined Polarities. And tonight we have with us Parisa Gaderi and Ibrahim Soltani with their artwork called Waiting for the Past. We're going to hear from the two artists about their artwork. Last but not least, Patricia Constantine. She's also here with us tonight, and her artwork is called Sin Eater. As introduction to our panelists, first of all, I'm going to start with Parisa Kaderi and Ibrahim Soltini. Soltani, I'm sorry. Uh, Parisa earned her BA in visual communications from Azad University in Tehran, Iran in 2006 and her MFA in art and design from the University of Michigan, the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design there in 2014. She focused on film and photography, and her work has been exhibited nationally, including in Detroit, New York City, and internationally in Australia, Iran, and the Ukraine. Ibrahim Soltani is a political science professor at Eastern Michigan University. He is also from Iran, and he collaborated with Parisa on this video that is shown in our gallery, and it is about a shared existential experience, the loss of a parent while being an immigrant. So we'll hear from the two artists in a little bit, but before we do that, let's talk for a second at least about Patricia Constantine. Uh, I've known P Patty for quite a while now, 
She was born in St. Petersburg, Florida, and there the world of carnivals and freak shows were a part of her childhood memories during the 1950s. Patty received her MFA from the University of Cincinnati in 1991, and she's currently a professor of illustration at Kendall College of Art and Design. Let's have a hand for our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start with Parisa and Ibrahim. So I'm going to pass on the clicker to them. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm Parisa Raderi, and I'm from Iran. Iran is in the Middle East, as you can see. And it's about 6,347 miles away from Ann Arbor, where I moved to in 2009. And if you want to go by a direct flight, it will take you about 15 hours, 55 minutes, but it's not possible because of the political situations between the two countries. Uh, there is no direct flight uh, between Iran and the US after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. So the earliest flight will, like the quickest one will take about um, 24 hours. And so, you can try other options, um, swimming and driving and other things, but um, certainly not walking. So it's really far from where I um, live currently in Ann Arbor. And so this is the very first piece that I um, created when I first came to Ann Arbor in response to my culture shock. It's called Strangers in Town. And it's been installed in downtown Ann Arbor since last year. And um, these are um, Persian miniature figures. Um, and um, they are hanging out in a new environment. Uh, the photograph in the background, in their background, is um, from somewhere in Ann Arbor. So um, their juxtaposition into a new environment makes them um, feel kind of, um, um, describes the feeling that I had when I first moved here and the dilemma between um, blending in and also standing out and being exotic as an immigrant. I can describe it for you, <laughs> no problem. So uh, this piece is a three-channel video. It's called Detachment, and it's a reenactment of um, the last scene, um, like the last experience at airports, like uh, when you say goodbye to your loved ones or when you're awaiting them to come and to arrive. So it has like three, um, it's a three-channel and there are people who are coming and waving or waiting and they're trying to find their loved ones or they're sad. So airport um, is considered by Marc Agé, a French philosopher, a non-place or a transitional place. But I think it's very um, emotionally charged of all these contradictory feelings that people have. Uh, when they want to leave their hometown. So this piece was a reenactment of that, those complex emotions, which unfortunately we couldn't see. So this is um, another piece. Uh, it's called Only an Inch Away. And um, so as an immigrant, when you move, um, you do not, uh, you not only experience the physical and geographical distance, but you also suffer from the emotional distance as a result. And um, gradually you um, think that you have um, a sheer presence in your loved one's life because you miss all these important occasions that you could be there like birthdays or New Year's or like family gatherings or even a family emergency. So um, this is a fabric installation, and there are, um, each panel, it's about two feet by 10 feet. And on the first, it's two layers, there are two layers, which are about an inch apart. You can go, and can you go back to the, to the break 
Yes. So on the first layer, um, these are um, the Iranian students who moved to Ann Arbor at different time periods. And on the second layer, there are their family photos in like different occasions, like birthdays or New Year's. And you can see through the um, back layer, but um, they have like a sheer presence. They are there, but almost there. So I just wanted to um, visualize that um, emotional distance that gradually becomes embedded um, in you as an immigrant. Yeah. So, and um, also another concept um, that I was dealing with um, as an immigrant, uh, because English is not my first um, language, uh, is the idea of language and also communication and translation. Uh, what happens to language um, when you cannot read and make sense out of it? And what are the things that are untranslatable, like poems or certain idioms and expressions that you cannot translate from your mother tongue to another language? Um, this piece was a mixed media installation, uh, which was part of the Art Pride 7. It was uh, installed at the Grand Rapids Art Museum in 2015. And um, it's a combination of um, photo transfer with, um, these are Farsi calligraphy, and these are poetry. And again, here I treated language as more as a form and a decorative object. And I was experimenting with what happens to text and language when it cannot communicate to the audience and deliver its message. And um, this is, um, so again, um, I'm always fascinated by language and translation and how we treat text and how we read it um, when it's not our uh, f mm, first language. Uh, this is uh, my thesis book, which I, I was able to publish it. And it's called Only an Inch Away. And it's an ontology of um, um, different ideas about distance, immigration, and loss. And um, as you can see, um, I was playing with um, pro even pronunciation became very important. And um, I was very conscious of pronunciation. When I came here, because, um, and every it's just um, overall, it's very fascinating when you move out of your hometown and go to another country, although you know some of the basics and the language, but how um, little things can mean differently and how you become conscious of um, little things that you've never paid attention to and how you become conscious of your own abilities. Like sometimes here um, when the professor is explaining and he's just going too fast, suddenly I translate and write in Farsi at the same time which I think um, I've never thought I could do this. So <laughs> it's, it's fascinating for me how I treat language too. And this is going to be um, the last um, series that I'm going to show tonight. And um, these are called visual poetry. And these are um, visual interpretation of um, poems by a very um, famous uh, Persian poet. Farooq Farooqzad, who was very um, famous during 1960s. She was very controversial because she was talking about um, all these contradictory feelings that women were experiencing during their lives, um, such as hope and despair, or feeling like a captive, and also um, the desire for freedom. Um, here, um, I um, used each poet uh, in it for each photo, and I um, <coughs> cut them, cut cut out them out of different materials. Like this one was out of paper, and the poem is about a woman who feels like a queen at her home, but she wears a paper crown, and like um, in all her poems, she talks about this um, ironic. Uh, situations that women are dealing with. And this one um, talks about um, 
a poem that a woman um, feels trapped uh, and like a prisoner, but at the same time, she has fallen in love with her prison guard. And this one is called Surprise. And um, this was more um, an um, investigation of the idea of um, how do we honor labor and um, usually giving a gift could be an act of liberation and showing um, your appreciation. But here, this woman is um, gifted with um, something which means more work. And um, so as you could see, um, most of my work um, deals with um, the idea of loss and language and all the, these contradictory feelings um, that I've been ex experiencing since I moved here. And this has carried through my recent work, which was a collaboration between um, Ebrahim and I, which I will let Ebrahim continue and expand on it. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Ebrahim Soltani. Um, I'm from Iran. Uh, now I'm an Iranian-American. I became an American citizen a few days before Mr. Trump becomes president of the United States. Um, so um, uh, I was a physician when I was in Iran. I was practicing as a physician for 10 years before coming here. And uh, uh, also I was uh, editor-in-chief uh, uh, editor of a journal we were publishing articles on the relationship between religion and politics, and uh, the government closed that journal. And I, I was, always wanted to come here and have a kind of uh, 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 academic uh, training here in social sciences. So in 2004, I decided to uh, leave the country, leave Iran behind, and come here, and I went to Syracuse University. I did my PhD in political science, political theory, and now I'm teaching political science at Eastern Michigan University. So uh, when you look at my background, uh, there is no art training. I'm not a professional artist, but I had the privilege and opportunity to work with a wonderful uh, um, artist. Uh, basically, this uh, work started when we were, uh, you know, I, I uh, know Parisa from two years ago. We both live in Ann Arbor we part of a small Iranian community in Ann Arbor. Uh, we are interested in Iran, but uh, in art. But uh, one other common characteristic that we have is that we both lost a parent while we were immigrants here. I lost my father in 2015, and she lost her mom in 2011. And for different reasons, we were not able to go back home. So we were not part of the process of taking care of a parent who was passing away. And we were not part of that you know, family process of grieving over somebody important that you love and you lose. Uh, we're thinking together and discussing the idea of uh, uh, you know, using art as a tool to conceptualize and categorize what was happening inside us to help us to understand what is going on in sort of psyche and mind and you know soul. And also at the same time being able to capture and communicate that message to the audience. Uh, we started to look at some family photographs that we had uh, and uh, we started to manipulate those photographs. This is one of those photographs. The movie that you can see in, uh, in the gallery here uh, is basically a translation or transformation of two family photographs. This is one of them. This is not the original photograph. In this photograph, uh, you see, uh, you see, you know, Parisa's father holding uh, Parisa's mom's hand in Columbus, Ohio. We, you know, uh, changed the uh, characters that you can see. We used some tapes and. We've worked on the, uh, uh, the original photograph to create this photograph. But at, uh, uh, when we wanted to produce the movie, we uh, used these characters to make one of, those, uh, uh, one of those two short movies. So this is one of the uh, uh, photographs. And the other one is actually a, a photograph of my family members taken in Istanbul, Turkey. 
So you see, that's my mom, uh, I'm there. That's my son, my sister-in-law, and you see the hand of my father there. Again, uh, this is the, the second photograph that we transformed to a short movie. Um, uh, photographs are usually imagined or understood as pieces of art which are silent and motionless. But when we were looking with all of those emotions that we had, when we were looking at these photographs, we realized that you know there, there is a voice hidden in those photographs, and there are motions in those photographs. And that was why we decided to capture those voices, those hidden voices and motions in those two photographs and transform them to these two short movies. Um, these two, two short movies that are embedded here, and probably we can't see them. <laughs> um, uh, and there is no way to imagine them if you haven't seen them. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll explain the episodes of those two movies. Yeah, okay, that's there. fine. Uh, um, these are two short movies, each uh, you know three minutes have uh, you know three minutes length, and each has th five different episodes. So basically, the characters of those two photographs are. Um, uh, recreated in these two short movies. Episode one of uh, each of these two movies is togetherness. You see all the ca characters standing next to each other or sitting next to each other like a photograph, right? The next episode of each short movie basically is the moment that one of the char characters realizes that it's time to go. It's like a message that you have to go right now and that character starts looking at his or her watch. This, this moment of realizing that you have to go is a moment that those who are surrounding you and having a kind of emotional relationship with you, it's a tragedy for all of them. So in episode three of these two short movies, you see that you know one of the characters starts to touch and attempt to keep the person who wants to leave or who has to leave in the place. But in next episode, you see that the character who is supposed to leave starts to leave slowly and you know leaves the everybody else behind and leaves the frame and finally in the last episode of the each short movie you see that you know uh, that person is back a uh, part of that person is back and we know that you know when when you leave this world you you, you check out but you don't leave basically everything behind you are present you're absent but at the same time you're present your memories objects related to you um, those uh, who have had some kind of relationship with you. And one of the things that we tried to capture in these uh, photographs and these two short movies was that uh, when somebody leaves, uh, there's not only an empty uh, space behind that person, but also the whole dynamics of relationship between those who are left behind changes. And we hope that we have been able to capture these changes and this emptiness and loss and grieving in these photographs. and. Uh, short movies. So let's stop here and uh, we would be more than happy to answer any question. Uh, maybe we can ask the questions after Patricia uh, presents also, and that way we can condense that portion of the presentation. So we'll give the floor to Patricia. Thank you again, Parisa and Ibrahim. She looks scary. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, I need, a, I need a mic. Well, actually, I don't need a mic because I'm, I'm pretty loud, but I need a mic for this. So I'm Patricia Constantine, um, and I'm a sin eater. Uh, uh, I did um, this uh, piece, and uh, thankfully, the Grand Rapids Community College uh, showed the piece because it, it is a little controversial. So I am thrilled that they had the guts to do that, and I really thank you for doing that. Um, so um, 
I, I think uh, in the little bio there, it's you know pretty much told you I'm from Florida. You guys know about Florida, right? It's the South on acid. So we, uh, we have a lot of carnivals, sideshows, attractions, mermaids. We believe in a lot of things that aren't real. Illusionism runs rampant, and I'm, I have a big like, um, memory of that as a child. Now, you need to understand I left Florida at 23. Actually, I ran screaming away from Florida at the age of 23. But now that I'm 61, you know, some of those things are really, you know, just sort of locked in. And I, you know, I really kind of love some of those things from a distance. Um, but I'm very, very interested in, in freak shows and side shows. Um, a lot of my work has to do, well, all of my work has to do with identity. Um, so being an older woman, you know, becoming less and less of some of the things that I used to be, for example, uh, at one time I was young and sexualized. Now don't, don't say it, you know, oh, Patty, you're still beautiful. No, I'm like your grandmother. And if you're sexualizing your grandmother, then you're going to end up on CSI, okay, because that's creepy. Um, but, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't really, you know, have that going for me anymore. Um, I was a mother, but my daughters are grown, and so, you know, they don't need me in the same way, so they're, they're kind of gone. Um, so, you know, my identity is, has changed a lot, and as a female, you know, Fu uh, functionally, I can't do some of the things that I, I could before, whether I, ha and I do believe in choice, but I, I can't even choose to do that now. You know, things have like shut off. Okay. So, so I'm, I, I feel a little strange. I feel a bit like a freak. I am very um, unusual right now. And I'm trying to, to kind of figure that out. So I'm using um, sideshows, freak shows, you know, as signifiers, okay? So a signifier, is just, it just means a sign, okay? It's just a symbol. It's a fancy art word for symbol, all right? And, and so, you know, the first time you sort of see, like, you know, a, a sideshow banner or something, instantly sort of clicks on, and it's easy for me to, to get viewers to kind of engage in what I want them to, to engage in. So, okay, let's see if I can work this technology here. Might have to have my... There we go. Okay, we're gonna we'll get back to her. So I I did believe in mermaids till I was about five years old. I thought they were absolutely real um, because they're everywhere in Florida. Yeah, they give beautiful women hoses at Wikiwachi Springs and they go under the spring and you know they have fake mermaid tails and so there there was all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm rather fascinated with this image, and and I'm also very fascinated with the Fiji mermaid, which is a gaff. Okay, I know you guys are familiar with the jackalope, right? That is a gaff. It is a, it is not a real thing. It is a taxidermied something pieced together with something else, and that's exactly what Barnum and Bailey's Fiji mermaid was. So, I'm I'm kind of, you know, messing with those a little bit and rather interested in, in them. And my mermaids, you know, tend to be a little creepier. I really love horror movies. Um, so I, I just um, let myself have a little bit of fun um, and, and sometimes just draw things that I want to draw. These are drawings. They're about six feet long, uh, 42 inches high, or the reverse. They're six feet tall and then 42 inches wide. And that's just as big as the paper I can get and how I can jump up and down on a stool. So that tends to be the, the size of them. Also, it makes them um, close to life size, which I, I do want them to be rather confrontational. I have started to use some of the, you know, uh, some of the stuff that you sort of see on Facebook or texting or whatever, like the WTF. Um, but Alive is, an, is an, um, actually an emblem that was used in sideshows, and I've just sort of adopted a few of my own emblems as we go on here. So the Bohemian Twins, okay, this was an actual sideshow. Um, they were real uh, women. Um, so all of these are actual actually my face, okay? So I put my face in place of that. So it's kind of a, um, you know, Cindy Sherman, if you're familiar with her, she does a lot of that, uses her own face and, and kind of adopts different identities. And so I'm just adopting different freak, freak people 
um, unique people. She Beast is also a sideshow. Um, she's kind of one of my favorites because I sort of feel like this most of the time. Um, these are watercolor washes underneath. So when you can see the um, uh, transparency, that's watercolor wash on the paper. And then it's charcoal and then pastel at the end. So it's a mixed media piece. I love to draw. I love mixed media. This is the bearded lady. I'd like to do her again. Um, she's a little too pretty for me. So I need to, like, you know, dog her up a little bit. Like, I, I was thinking, man, I need hair coming out of more places than just, you know, the beard and the mustache, because that's really kind of more like what happens. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's probably going to be another bearded lady along the, along the way here. Now, this is the first one I did. This is uh, like after the Fiji mermaid. Um, this actually is the only one that is not me. This is my youngest daughter, Sophia, who reluctantly posed for me and reluctantly likes for me to not tell people that it's her. Um, but, you know, that's the life you have to suffer if you're the child of an artist. Um, so, so, uh, but you know, in doing this one, and that's the actual sort of drawing after the print of the Fiji mermaid, it doesn't exist anymore. And I don't even think the print exists anymore. There's just copies of the print. Uh, so, um, I, you know, that's where, this is where it's sort of started for me. So I really like, like this piece a lot. So I keep it in there. So I've also done some three dimensional pieces go. Maybe, maybe not. Am I doing? Okay, there we go. Nope, it's not gonna let me. Oh well. Oh, technology. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, I had to do a, <laughs> I was asked to do a piece for the Muskegon Museum of Art, like had this beer show and they invited artists to like do a piece, you know, for the beer show. And I think they may have like regretted asking me, but um, <laughs> I, so I did this piece. I do want to do some more clowns because I, I just love clowns, um, scary clowns. Yes, I loved um, American Horror Story Freaks. That's my favorite. Uh, but um, the thing I will say about this, it, it, it too is fairly large. It's, it's a little square. So I want to say it's like four by five, four feet by five feet. But when I went to see it at the, um, at the show, at the opening, you know, people kind of walk kind of around my work a little bit like it's going to jump out and get them. But people are getting their picture taken with it. And I do kind of enjoy that that part of it because I, it feels more like a sideshow, like a carnival, like I'm an exhibition, you know? Um, so I, I really got a kick out of that. So I, I definitely need to do more clowns. Scary clowns. And I saw it too, I really liked that one. Oh, sugar, why aren't you doing? Right, I'm getting close to throwing it. Because <laughs> I'm a 61-year-old woman without a filter. All right, I don't understand here. Come on. It is. Ah, there we go. Okay. I was probably pushing something wrong. Nick, I, you know, I repel technology, I swear. Um, so here are some of the boxes. This was actually in a gallery space. And you can see um, I created these boxes. I created these boxes. Um, they are called magic boxes for me. And um, I went on sabbatical. I went to Scotland. I have a real fascination with Scotland. It's all about like magic. Um, you know, the history is very supernatural. You know, I just, I just really, really love that. So I met a couple of magicians there. And one of them had a magic box in his studio. And um, so the glass on the outside is actually the glass that, you know, if you're arrested and, um, you know, the glass that the detectives can see through, but you can't see through that. Not that I have any on-site experience with this. I just know this from research, okay? Um, so, so anyway, I ordered some of that glass. 
Uh, I had the boxes made, and then I painted the boxes. I knew what I wanted to do with them, and then there are things inside the boxes. Oop. They also require electricity, which I am not an electrician, but I did have a little help with that. Oh, now I'm really talking loud. Okay, so this is what happens with the box. You, it, there's a sensor, so you walk past it and you sort of look, and it's a mirror, and then it pops on, and there's a scary thing inside, a gaff. And these are my heads. Um, I had one of my colleagues at Kendall, we have a 3D printer there, so he scanned my head, and I got all these little heads of mine made, and so I used them um, in the boxes. Now, on top of that, that's not my head. Uh, I, did, I do find unusual things. Um, I like to go look for strange things in strange stores. And then there are titles. Now, I'm not big on titles usually, but I wanted to have kind of an um, implied narrative with these that linked back to my identity. And I will tell you, the gaffes that I'm going to show you, the things that are inside the box, they have my hair. They have my daughter's teeth. I collected them when, you know, when they lose their teeth. See, you're going to like totally think I'm like Ed Gein or something. I do have interesting collections of things. So they have my DNA. And I think that's really cool. I mean, most people would probably find it creepy. You know, but so head of un unidentified female found, found by Pansy Crow. Pansy Crow was my grandmother, all right? Chattanooga, Tennessee is where she's from. And then the dates are kind of around times when I was around those people. So, so and again, those teeth that you see on there, those are my daughter's teeth, my head. And then I believe that's actually my oldest daughter, Antonia's hair that I've wrapped around. But you can see the light comes on and it sort of glows. It also scares the crap out of you. So I've had, <laughs> when I had the show initially, my students would, you know, walk past a box and, you know, they would come to class and it's like, oh my God, Patty, you're scaring the crap out of me, your work, you know, like flashes on and the, you know, the um, exhibition space is a little bit darker, like they turn the lights up when they did the, the shots of everything. But I really love that. I mean, I want it to be kind of like a carnival, you know, so. So I'll just go through some, some of these, I'm not gonna. So that's my head inside of a possum skin. Now don't get mad at me if you're a vegan or I love animals too. Um, there's this really cool store in Chicago called the Woolly Mammoth and they have all kinds of different strange things but they had this possum pelt. So I'm sorry. And then I've got a couple of mermaids. One's a freshwater mermaid, and then the other one is a saltwater mermaid. And there she is. Whoop. And then the last, this is the last one that I did. Um, so I'm gonna go back here really fast to the Sin Eater piece. So we can talk about that a little bit. Um, these drawings take me about three months to do, uh, but it can often take me like a year to do some research, to do some drawings, to do some sketching. I'm assuming most of y'all are um, art students. So, you know, I kind of like to share that with art students. I don't just like go into the studio and go, hey, I'm gonna draw a mermaid. Um, I do do uh, a lot of reading. I like to look into other things. I like some of my ideas to like, you know, cross over each other. Um, I'll often do a number of different sketches before I go to the big paper. And that's a big part of it because I am gonna work so large that there are some things that I need to work out first before, you know, I start like wasting paper that costs me a ton of money. Um, and and it, things can go through changes. Like this piece went through a number of changes. Initially, it was just gonna be Jolly Dolly, who is the usual fat lady in the circus, um, you know, the sideshow banner. And so I, that's what I was working on. And I was also looking at um, 
uh, the seven deadly sins. So I was looking at gluttony. And so I had some different images for that on the side panels. And I just kept sort of drawing her. And I was also doing a lot of reading about education because I'm a teacher. And I'm starting to feel really guilty, not starting, I feel really guilty about teaching and having my students finish and maybe if they're lucky, they're gonna get a thirty to $40,000 a year job, if they're lucky, and they may have invested or be in debt between eighty to $200,000. And that's just wrong. That is wrong. That, uh, that's, you know, people make the jokes about, you know, young people moving back in with their parents. Well, this is why. They have so much student debt that they have to go back and live with their parents. They can't afford to buy a house. They can't afford to buy a car, probably. Um, and like I said, it just keeps going up. So if the um, cost of your education goes up that high, but you're not going to make enough money to pay for it, then what's going to happen? Well, then education is going to be for the elitist. And poor people, like myself, I was a really, really poor kid, are not going to be able to go to college or go to school. Now, maybe you choose not to. Maybe you choose to you know, go and do something different. That's fine. But you should have the choice, and it shouldn't be about your class, okay, or your economic standing. That is wrong. Each of us has dreams. We should be allowed to pursue those dreams, all right? Not be locked into something because of money. Um, so it makes me feel sick to my stomach. Um, so again, I was doing all this reading. Like I said, I went to, on sabbatical to Scotland. I was reading a lot about Scotland and came across the term sin eater. And I thought, that's me. I'm a sin eater. I'm eating the sins of public education. I'm eating the sins of college education as a teacher. And, you know, um, so that became the fat lady, not jolly dolly, uh, but a sin eater. And of course, then that sort of changed the whole kind of focus because <laughs> one of the reasons um, I don't think that education is going to change right away is because our current administration is not so um, warm when it comes to each of us uh, being allowed to have uh, the same education, all right? So yes, I put uh, Donald Trump on one side, and I want to build a wall, I felt, had a couple of different meanings, not only the stupidity of building a wall between here and Mexico, but also building a wall between the haves and the have-nots, all right? So the classes. Um, and then, uh, now I have to tell you, Betsy did not say no free lunch. This was a term that was given to her because a lot of the things that she wants to institute, all right, are going to cause those programs to be cut so that, you know, um, kids won't be given a free lunch. Um, we won't have money for uh, kids that have special needs, all right? So those programs will be cut. So that's, that's how the no free lunch thing came about. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not quoting her, but she definitely has to, like, you know, absorb that. Um, so the more I realized that those two were going to be a prominent part of the, of, the, of the piece, the more I kept paring it down and just realizing, okay, well, now I know what the color scheme is. Now, I, I knew I was gonna have a red underpainting, but, uh, you know, and the red curtain is definitely like, you know, a, a symbol for me, I love that. But I just realized I needed to go, you know, all out red, white, and blue and just, you know, really embrace the whole thing. Now, I, I want to say something else, <laughs> um, because I, I, maybe you'll ask, maybe, maybe not, but I just want to fess up. So I've always had, um, my, my work has always been um, edgy, and uh, it has had political um, references um, before. I know that. And I have to take responsibility for that. Do you know what I'm saying? So I do recognize that the community of Grand Rapids is not going to be jumping up and down around me because I've put a DeVos on my artwork. It's one of the reasons that the Detroit Free Press contacted me. They weren't talking about Sin Eater. 
but they were asking how I felt about putting a DeVos on my piece. And if I was worried that it was go not going to be shown. Um, and of course, you know, it was, and so I was able to answer that, but I was also able to talk a little bit about education. And then when the New York Times called, and that really shocked me, um, that was almost kind of laughable because it was sort of like, okay, who's like, kid, you know, kidding me here? Um, that was the, you know, the the whole idea behind their story was, you know, this this is a, a, a contest that's uh, uh, started by a DeVos, and then you've got his mom up up on your piece, you know. Do you think, you know, did you think twice about doing that? I thought about it, yeah, I thought about it, but she's the Secretary of Education, so I didn't give her that job. She decided to take it. Um, I teach illustration. Part of what I teach is editorial illustration. So if I tell my students, oh, you know, don't put certain people on there, because you'll, you know, don't, you'll be scared, okay, because they might come after, after you. I mean, you know, Look, it just means that Channel 8 News is not going to um, interview me, nor will I be in the New York Times or on M Live or anything like that. However, I get to talk to you people. I was in the New York Times, so, you know, the Grand Rapids Press can go screw itself, excuse my language, and, um, and the Detroit Free Press, so that's a lot better. I got to show in a great venue that's actually an educational institution, and again, that made me feel really good that you know, I could actually show in a place where there are students. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I decided to put her image in there, and I'm fine with that, and I realize that there may be consequences, you know, which means I'm just not going to get the kind of press that, that some people will. But that's okay, because, you know, I, it's, it's my piece, and I, I really want to get that out there. Um, I want to tell you something else, too. I'm a tenured full-time professor at Kendall. I might have thought longer if I was part-time and not protected. When you have tenure, it means they can't fire you unless you do something really, really bad. Um, and then they have to haul you to Lansing. Uh, excuse my gum. I didn't want to cough, so I've got, um, so forgive me if you think, oh, she's chewing gum up there. It's so disgusting. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, I have a stream of consciousness thinking. Um, anyway, I might have thought a little longer about it with that. Um, I could have potentially lost my job, actually, I think. You know, they might have just sort of forgot to call me the next time they were hiring part-time people at the places that I was working. Do you know what I'm saying? So I do, I do, I do recognize that, but, I, but I'm making that choice. I have to take that responsibility, so. So, um, that's, that's that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you to all the artists. And um, let me see, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we'll run a mic. I see a question back there. Okay, so... Uh, uh, please think about it. If you have something to ask the artists, please do. And at the end, by the way, because I don't want to forget it, we do have a reception right outside here so everybody can enjoy some refreshments. Hi, thank you for sharing. My name is Ron Pickering. I am a student here in the uh, photography department. Uh, first of all, as a veteran, um, I served to protect people's right to speak whatever they want and for immigrants to come here. So I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you for coming here. My question about this art, I noticed the hands almost look like they're in a namaste type position. Was that an intentional, like centering piece? Correct. I was trying to figure out, oh, sorry. I was trying to figure out like what to do with the hands, you know? Um, and in most of the pieces that you see, jolly dolly, she's got a fork and a knife. But because I had the bread um, in there, and that's, that's a traditional, like putting the bread on the breast of the, the dead. Um, and then the sin eater would eat the bread off the, off the dead, off the breast. Um, but I thought it, would, it might be appropriate to have them, you know, almost like she's, she's uh, praying <laughs> that it gets better. <laughs> Right. 
Another question here. First of all, I'm really glad you got your citizenship before anything happened. Um, second of all, I really like uh, what your piece said about uh, loss and um, the idea of having emotional distance. Uh, it's it, honestly looking anywhere in the history of the U.S. We're the melting pot. It's it's immigrants that have made this country what it is. And uh, um, the fact that you guys can come here and uh, make such a beautiful piece about um, the human condition is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to talk about um, Sydney, Deer, Sydney Deer a little bit. And when I first saw it, Sydney Deer Eater didn't occur to me. You know what I thought? Senator, do nothing senators. And I went back and I read the history of Sin Eater, mm -hmm. and I just absolutely love this piece. Oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you. But I like that little, you know, ah, oh, Senator. Oh, nice. I'm a writer. I'm so a, <laughs> oh, thank you. I might steal that. I'll give you credit, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> I don't want to stand, but I commend you on, on your bravery for even putting her in that and how you have Trump in that also. I commend you on that, and, and I really like that piece also. And you guys, is your immigrant, I that was awesome. It was really deep, your stories behind that. They were really nice. We have a question over here. Um, I have a question for the first two artists. Um, I know you spoke a lot about complex emotions um, and kind of that inner struggle. Um, I'm kind of wondering, when you like made this art, did you, for a second, feel as if, um, when you created an art, were, like, were you ever discouraged, like people didn't really take your art the way you meant it to be? Because I know like the like b the background of this has like so many emotions. And I think like my opinion is you kind of need stuff like that to create like beautiful art. And I'm like so like inspired by the stuff you guys create. I'm just wondering um, when you were creating that, were you ever like, man, I don't think like that, you said that lack of communication, like were you ever discouraged, like people didn't really get the message you wanted from it? Or was it kind of like you just were happy it was out there? Like what was the kind of emotion of putting that out there? I know that's like a very like personal aspect of your life. And how did you kind of feel when people reacted to your art? So are you referring to a specific piece or in um, general? The kind of like piece that came to me was like the first one when you said it was installed, like uh -huh. it was the... Um, the Persian the, yeah, the figures, figures yes. on that one box. Uh -huh. So did people kind of react the way you expected them to? Did you get um, kind of a you know, response? I, to um, like most of the Persian people in my community reacted to it because um, um, there's a big population of Persians um, in Ann Arbor because of the UL ban, because uh, most of the like Persians go there for PhD and it has become very trendy right now. So after um, undergrad, people from Iran like mostly um, go for higher education, and U of M has a really good reputation, especially in engineering. So uh, most of, but you don't see much Iranian art around, or even Middle Eastern art. That's what I'm trying to curate more of, like, and trying to exhibit more Iranian show because um, the image that people are seeing are usually very black and white. Uh, there's no shades of gray, but the reality is the opposite. When you go to Iran and you can see how um, things are different from what media shows here. So, and, um, so for that piece, um, the people felt that lack of having um, something to um, relate to in Ann Arbor, so like people in my community were really happy to recognize some familiar imagery. 
Um, I didn't mm, got anything. I didn't hear anything from like my American friends, but I got a lot of like um, feedback and compliments from people in my community. But in general, when I, for example, the piece that was in Art Prize Seven two years ago, it was very interesting for me to, because I was um, there during the opening and I was uh, um, able to go there on and off uh, to see how people react to the piece because the poetry was in Farsi and they couldn't read it. Um, but I was really interested in see their response and see if they ever see it as language. And people had different ideas and interpretations. Some people didn't know, they thought that, oh, we thought that it's just the pattern or some decorative motifs. It didn't even um, um, come to their mind that it could be language or poetry. But when I was approaching them and say, do you want the translation? they so like, oh, is it is it a, like a sentence? What is it? We, we had no idea it could. So it was interesting for me um, that how um, language and text can totally lose its ability to communicate and becomes totally form. So that was one aspect. So I usually people um, have their own ways of interpre interpreting uh, my work, but sometimes because it's too personal, I sometimes have this fear of people not getting it or relating to it. But I think um, at the very core, these are all things that we experience during our lifetime. Like the idea of loss or moving, even if it's within the country, we always leave someone behind. So I think these are all common experiences. All right, thank you very much. Let's give our artists a hand. <laughs> thank you for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, we are out of time, we learned a lot, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Please join us for a reception right out in the lobby and meet the artists and you can ask them more questions. Thank you again, and we look forward to another art prize next year. <laughs>